Yes. Uh, Professor Ironside, uh, I, I've asked you questions about um, the reasons why um, the, it, those with bleeding disorders weren't notified of their at-risk um, uh, at for public health purposes uh, status until September 2004. I'm not going to get, go back over those, but uh, I've been asked to ask you whether or not you consider that that delay con constituted a public health risk. Well, I think that given that around that time was the, the time the first transfusion-related case of variant CJD was identified in 2003, and then the asymptomatic case in 2004, that, uh, that those were um, sadly timely reminders of how, how things can change, and I think it would have been much better if... if the notification had been uh, done earlier. How much of a risk this may have entailed, I think, is very difficult to estimate. But I couldn't say that it. it I couldn't exclude the possibility that it, that it might have done. Mm. If there is mm. a public health risk, and, and the, mm. certainly the logic of mm. the measures that were taken was that there was. Mm. Uh, then to take those actions to uh, avert it or minimise it mm. later than would have been done constitutes yes. in itself an additional risk. Uh, yeah, yes, in that sense, the earlier the better, but, but it's, it's very diff difficult to then quantify what that additional oh, risk would, I, I, would I have been. I don't think you're being asked yes. to say how much, no. <laughs> but, the, but mm. the, there mm. was some. Yes, yes, no, no, I, I'd agree, yeah. Do you know whether or not there were errors in the notification process, for example, wrong batch numbers being identified and, and the wrong people being notified that they were at risk mm. for public health purposes? I, I have to confess that we were, I was n never involved in, in that, that aspect of the, of the notification process. Um, I would hope that that wasn't the case, but it, it, it may well have happened. I, mean, I think, uh, in, in, in general, uh, you know, hospital records do sometimes contain errors of uh, number identification and, and missing numbers. Um, so, uh, but, but I don't know for sure. <clears throat> um, now, we, we've heard quite a lot of technical evidence mm. about the risk of those receiving implicated plasma products. Mm. And by implicated plasma products, I mean uh, plasma products that mm. have been um, uh, contributed, that con contributed to by, mm. by somebody that has a diagnosis of BCJD. Yes. Um, I'm asked to ask you this, that mm. if you were issuing, issuing the VCJD notification again, would you say mm. that the risk for those that have received implicated plasma products was, was low? Or, or are you not able to say it would depend on the product and how much they had received? Yeah, well, I, I think the, the situation is somewhat analogous to blood and blood transfusion. The, the, the infectivity level in, in blood is low, but if you get enough of it, then it can be enough to transmit the disease. And so um, the risk from plasma products, you know, one dose probably is very low, but um, most patients, I guess, have received many, many more doses, and so the risk is correspondingly greater. Um, do you know who brought about the arrangement that all UK health departments and all four blood services should receive notification of a diagnosis of VCJD? I don't know. I, I, I know that the unit does that, it does notify all of them, but I don't know who brought that about, I'm afraid. <clears throat> um, in your, this is a question mm. about leukodepletion, mm. in your statement you reach a conclusion that it, it perhaps could have been done earlier. Mm. What, what was the basis for reaching that conclusion? <clears throat> 
I think leukodepletion has been used in other countries as, as well. So there was some um, experience of, 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 of this happening. Um, I'm not an expert in, in blood transfusion, but I do know that any change to the practices of donation it has also always got to be weighed against what the implications to the blood supply might be. Um, and it, of course, it carries an expense with it, but, but, but leukodepletion um, what was nothing completely new, and also it might, it probably does have other advantages in reducing the risk of uh, cell associated infections with some viruses. For example, cytomegalovirus it can be transmitted by blood transfusion because the virus is in the white cells. So if you filter them away, that, that uh, removes or reduces that risk. So it, it may have been possible to do it before then, but uh, I, I, I'm, the, the possibility was first discussed at that very early meeting in 1996 that I had with uh, uh, representatives of the National Blood Services in in Edinburgh, and, and you've got a, a note of that meeting, I think, as one of the, the documents. And that, that occurred just very shortly after the variant CJD had been identified and announced. And unfortunately, when that meeting occurred, my colleague, Professor Wu, I think, was on holiday at the time. So I had to go and uh, speak to the blood authorities, which ended up being the first of very many meetings I had with these individuals. But at that time, uh, measures such as leukodepletion were discussed. And so it wasn't in for another three years, I think, till it was fully implemented in uh, end of 99. <clears throat> so, um, and I think the, for the transcript, the date of that meet meeting was 9th of April 1996? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So is your evidence that it could have been um, implemented earlier, before 9th of April 1996, for other reasons other than VCJD? Because other, mm -hmm. other countries were introducing it for other reasons. Or are you yeah, saying it, that, that it could have been introduced no. earlier because of the risk of VCJD? Well, I, I, I think pro probably both. I mean, other countries introduced it. Not, it wasn't primarily for variant CJD uh, reasons, although that would be the case uh, in uh, France, for example. Um, so it, it wasn't such a, a novel thing um, entirely, but it, it's just a question of uh, making the decision and trying to scale, scale up the needs and, and, and meet those needs, that, that was done eventually. I, I don't know if that was as quick as it could have been. I, that, I that, that's really what I'm trying to say. Uh, and and <coughs> so uh, does it follow from that, from <coughs> your, your answer, that <coughs> you, you wouldn't be able to say how, how much earlier it, it could have been? Uh, no, no, I couldn't say that, sorry. <coughs> um, <coughs> now, you've given evidence about, I've asked you questions about <coughs> the different blood tests and so on, <coughs> and um, <coughs> is it right to understand your evidence that um, you consider there should be a blood test available for um, those that have been exposed to uh, risk of VCJD? Well, that, yeah, yes, uh, that would be one use of it. I think the other use, the, the other important use would be to do, uh, if, if you like, a prevalence study uh, uh, using these tests to see if the results of the appendix study are actually um, reinforceable in that way or, or if there's something different then that might be good news or, or it might be worse actually but, but, but it would be good to, to do that. I think in terms of individual testing um, there would have to be some m wider discussion about that because if it was uh, just after, shortly after an exposure, a negative test might not be as reassuring as, as it would be uh, some time further down the line. But, but uh, the, there's no reason why that scenario couldn't be looked at and, and developed. Um, mm. And mm. in relation to the, mm. your knowledge mm. uh, about how developed mm. the DDA and the PMCA are, mm. Would you be able to say how 
how far away such a test, a diagnosis mm. to give mm. peace of mind to those mm. that have been exposed mm. might be? Well, I, I think <coughs> the combination of these tests could be could be used, and uh, it's a question of scalability. How quickly could it be scaled up? And, and you know, we've lost so much time since the, that. And even I, I, I recall this was discussed at the uh, Science and Technology uh, Committee in Parliament about blood, and their recommendations were that, that you know those tests should be funded and, and scaled up, but that seems not to have happened. I'm just trying to find the date of, mm. of that, so I don't immediately have it to uh, uh, mind. But I, I think the report was in 2014. I can't immediately put mm. my hands on it. Mm. Um, okay. uh, I'll turn now oh, to um, questions about post-mortem um, mm. and tissue samples. Um, mm. I've been asked to ask you, are there any best practice guidelines mm. about informing relatives mm. of, of the post-mortem process and gaining mm. consent for VCJD mm. autopsies? Yes, I think, I, I think there are. And um, I've certainly uh, helped uh, the CJD support network, which is uh, an organization designed uh, to support relatives of all, pati all patients with all forms of faint CJD and I did a, uh, an article for them which I think is still on the, the website explaining what's involved in, in a post-mortem and what um, is required in terms of consent or, or in fact not giving consent and that, that's okay and also to uh, to tell relatives that they can change their mind um, if they decide that they eventually wouldn't like the samples to be retained. If they change their mind about that, then that's fine. We can deal with that if they let us know. So uh, th there are, and there's also further guidance on the uh, MRC website relating to the Brain Bank Network about this. And you mm. exhibited mm. to your statement uh, a code of practice mm. from the Human Tissue Authority yes. called Guiding mm. Principles and the Fundamental Principle of Consent, which isn't specific mm. to post-mortems no. VCJD, but mm. the principles mm. in there would apply, would they, to um, issues around post-mortem for VCJD? Yes, I, I, absolutely. The, um, the principle of consent I, I, is fundamental to the... Human Tissue Act, and when I was involved in the Human Tissue Authority in setting up the uh, guidelines for uh, autopsy and re research, the, the consent was absolutely fundamental, and it should be informed consent, and it, it, it can be qualified consent, and it, it, for example, the postmortem can be restricted to examination of the, 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 the brain alone and not the rest of the body. Uh, and consent can be withdrawn afterwards in terms of retention of tissue samples. So, so that's all in, in those, uh, those documents. Uh, and <coughs> when you are involved, or when you were involved, mm. I should say, in a post-mortem study, mm. presumably as the neuropathologist, you, mm. you don't, you're not involved in the consent process, is that right? That's done by the clinicians who have been treating the patient. Yes, that, that's right. I mean, we provide the clinicians with information uh, about the setting our clinical team and the, both the, uh, the research fellows, the, the, the training neurologists who visit the patients and the nurses uh, all had information about autopsies and consent and uh, they were able to explain things to relatives. Uh, and uh, as did the support network and occasionally I was contacted by Julian Turner who at the time was the, the chair of the, the network um, to give more specific advice uh, unfortunately with variant CGD and also I guess with HIV there are other issues that cause great uh, stress uh, to relatives uh, concerning uh, 
uh, after the autopsy or after the death of the patient and how the, the body of the deceased is treated by the undertakers. And there have been some very unfortunate circumstances uh, surrounding that that we've tried to help with. And so mm. when you are, mm. what do you do to satisfy yourself mm. um, when you undertake a post-mortem mm. that relatives know what, what will be done and that the consent process has been adequate? Well, we, we firstly, we would examine the consent form that the relatives have signed to make sure that uh, it is signed, that it's been filled in appropriately, uh, and they've acknowledged that they've received this information and they've been given the opportunity to qualify the consent should they so wish. If there's any suggestion that the the you know, the, the way the form's been filled in is incomplete or it's inconsistent or, or in a way contradictory, um, then um, we wouldn't go ahead with that until these issues had been resolved. Um, you mentioned um, when you were giving evidence early mm. that mm. there was um, tissues served in, um, stored, sorry, in mm. the brain bank at Edinburgh. Yes. I've been asked to ask you what tissues or bodily samples uh, are stored there from uh, people with haemophilia and, and for what purpose? Well, the, the tissues from people with haemophilia that were stored were samples of uh, many of the internal organs, uh, the heart, the lung, the liver, the kidney, the spleen, the lymph nodes, the gut, uh, uh, and, and the brain, and sometimes the spinal cord, depending on what the consent that was obtained. And uh, they have been stored uh, for the purposes of research into HIV and other pathogens that occur in AIDS, uh, looking at uh, the sequence of the virus in the brain to see if it, if it was the same as uh, looking uh, at the virus in the rest of the body. In other words, is there a subclone of the virus that's more likely to attack the brain than, than not? Uh, sometimes patients who had, uh, had not necessarily with haemophilia, but who had uh, uh, cytomegalous inf virus infection of the eye, which uh, gives severe visual problems, and uh, some of these patients were treated and we were able, by examining the, the, the retina, to, to look at the effects of the treatment to see how that had progressed, and that gave the clinicians then some insight as to uh, whether the treatment was in fact working and, and what, what improvement was being made. So a whole, a whole range of things, and, and the, the material is uh, available to researchers, not just in Edinburgh, but in, in the, the rest of the UK and elsewhere, provided they submit uh, a justified project which either has ethical approval or uh, will be reviewed uh, by an ethics committee and we would withhold uh, provision of the samples until that had been cleared. Um, and uh, lastly, I was asking you questions about mm. Professor Bell's work and your supporting work looking at um, uh, those uh, with he people with haemophilia who had died from HIV yes. and AIDS. Mm. Yes. Mm. And you said that there was some very interesting findings mm. emerging from that work. Now, mm. acknowledging that you have told us already mm. that you weren't mm. involved in the analysis mm. of that work, mm. I, I've been asked to ask you what those interesting findings were. Well, I, I know that... <sighs> My knowledge of most of that is the, the, the findings in the brain, but I know there was a lot of research also done about uh, the effects of the HIV and the distribution of the HIV virus in other parts of the body as well as other pathogens that occur in, 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 in full-blown AIDS. Um, and in the uh, looking in the brain uh, to see what the structural effects uh, were on the brain from the HIV virus to see how the virus uh, spread in uh, a type of cell in the brain called the microglial cell and, and how it entered the brain probably from the blood. It was able to cross the blood-brain barrier into the brain, infect these cells and then spread. 
and then looking at the effects uh, of treatment once treatment became uh, available for HIV, how the spread of the virus in the brain was modified in those who'd been treated and those who hadn't been treated, and then to look uh, at those who had been on treatment for longer periods and then died, because some of them, although the HIV in the, the body, as it were, was under control, in the brain sometimes it wasn't. And we wanted to know what the substrate of, of, of that was. And uh, we found evidence of uh, other structural changes in the brain, including uh, structures we call neurofibrillary tangles that appear in the brain actually in some diseases like Alzheimer's disease. They're not specific for Alzheimer's disease, but they, they were occurring in, in the brain of these uh, long-term treated, indicating that although they were being treated, the treatment in the brain wasn't apparently fully effective and there were long-term structural changes occurring as a consequence. Uh, and did you examine, as part of that work, brains from other people infected by transfusion, so not people with haemophilia but who were infected with HIV via blood transfusion? Yes. And was there a yes. difference? I think that the, the no, not, 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 not so many differences. I think the HIV patients, unfortunately, um, had often had so many pathologies because they had HIV, they had hepatitis B, they had hepatitis C, so the, the liver pathology would be different in those. But I think the first, uh, one of the first uh, AIDS cases that um, we examined in, in Edinburgh was a patient who had received a, a, an infected blood transfusion after an operation um, for cancer and uh, they had developed this and obviously they didn't have the changes in the liver and all, all the other changes so the, the burden of disease generally in the haemophilia population the, the range of pathogens was much wider than those who'd received uh, just from uh, one uh, implicate one infected transfusion. And um, is that, mm. are the results from that work published? Well, my, my colleague, Professor Bell, has published extensively on, on this, and uh, uh, I, I don't um, have all the details of our publications uh, on it, but both she and her colleagues, uh, uh, there was an infectious diseases doctor called Ray Brettel, I think his name was. He was very closely involved in that. So uh, a, a search in, in the literature would uh, show, but, but uh, there, there were really a significant number of publications arising from that work. So those are the questions from the core participants and their legal representatives that I'm going to ask um, Professor Ironside. Um, I don't think uh, Professor Ironside's legal representatives want to ask any questions. Do you have any questions? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I have questions of two, two matters. The, the first <coughs> is that almost in passing, uh, you use the expression that linked the, the DNV um, study with uh, the idea of clearance. So you hadn't, uh, or you don't in your statement, mm. um, identify those uh, uh, as a, a feature which may reduce the risk of prion disease developing, the possibility of clearance. Now, I appreciate we don't know much about uh, the, uh, the natural history of, of prion disease in the body, but mm. is, is it um, part of a, a theory or, or a model that at least at lower levels of um, presence, mm. I won't say infection, presence in the body, mm. the body is capable of clearing... Mm. The, um, the misshapen protein. Uh, yes, I, I think that that concept comes. I mean, it's related to the idea of the infectious dose that you can be exposed to less than one infectious dose uh, on one occasion, and it, can, it may be cleared. But if you're exposed repeatedly, then uh, that that exposure can result in, in an infection. I think the other issue was with the, the DNV report was, apart from the clearance, was this idea of um, not having a, 
a threshold of infectivity above which it doesn't matter how much more you receive, you, you, you're going to be infected anyway. The, the, the first DNV report, it, it was just, they, they had a linear model, which I, I think was very heavily criticized both at the time and actually subsequently in, in, in the literature. And that's why it was felt necessary to have the revision in 2003, because the model they were using simply didn't meet the needs of the CJD incidence panel, particularly in relation to blood and blood products. The, the, other, the other question really arises out of um, what might be um, a, a, an ambiguity for some readers uh, in, uh, in your report. Uh, and if I can just uh, ask uh, you, please, to put up on the screen, Lawrence, uh, the witness statement 7034 WITM, this is, 7034001. And if you go to page 80, I'm going to ask you to put that on one side of the screen, if you can, please, uh, and page 81 on the other side. Now, if we look uh, at page uh, 80, paragraph 2, it, it begins with, with this. If patients have been exposed to a threshold of 1% or greater potential risk of VCJD over and above the general risk to the UK population believed to have resulted from dietary exposure to the BSE agent, uh, the, the advice was that it should be considered at increased risk. Uh, and if we go over to... The, the other side, almost at the same position on the page, about 10 lines up at the bottom, mm. there's a line beginning plasma products. Mm -hmm. And let me, if we can have that highlighted possibly, can we, Lawrence? The, the sentence begins mm -hmm. to reduce the possibility of onward transmission of VCJD. The panel advised in 2004 the public health precautions should be taken in recipients of, quote, high risk and, quote, medium risk, thank you, uh, implicated plasma products who had exceeded the 1% additional risk threshold. Mm. Now, it, the question really arises, it, it can be put perhaps best this way, 1% of what? Is it 1% of the risk they already had? That is, mm. a risk, if you take the, the appendix one and two studies, mm. Uh, of 0.02 percent of the population, 0 0.04 of the population. Mm. Um, so one percent of that would make it point what? 0 0.0202, zero mm. two. Um, or is it one percent of the what is supposed to be the general population being yeah. at risk? Yeah, what? Yes, I, t I, s I see what you mean. It, it's not one percent of the 0 0.02 or, or 0 0.04. It's one percent. Additional, additional risk. Additional, yes. So it makes it, the risk is, if you like, if you were being mathematical about yes. it, if you could put yes. it mathematically, it would be 1.02% now instead of 0 0.02. Yes. Yes, so that's really quite a significant yes. increase in risk, which yes. is why, although 1% may look small yes. to the reader, mm. it is actually quite a step up. Yes, and, and that's why it was, it was chosen as... Uh, I mean, there were a whole range of other possibilities considered, but that, that was felt on balance to be um, big enough to do something uh, that to, to really was big enough for, for intervention to be required. So, and conceptually, it's thought to be something like 25 to 50, 50 times more. more. Mm. Yes. Well, I, I thought I'd just... My check my understanding of that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. That's all that I, I have to, to ask. Thank you. Mm. Uh, Professor Ironside, have you got anything mm. you would like to add to your evidence? Uh, not to my evidence, no. I, I, I just want to say that um, working in this field has, has uh, really drawn my attention to the um, really the horrifying nature of these diseases and the, the, the burdens that they cause on uh, the patients themselves and the, the relatives of, of, of these patients. And um, my colleagues and I in the surveillance unit uh, are very grateful to the relatives for supporting our research um, by giving 
con consent for research in, in tissue samples, which I, as a pathologist, use, but also consent to take part in the case control studies and the other epidemiological studies. Uh, so we're, we're very grateful uh, to all these uh, individuals. And also I'd like to thank my colleagues in the surveillance unit who have supported me and whose work is quoted in, in my own uh, evidence uh, over uh, the long period that uh, I, I worked on that disease. So, uh, and uh, that's all I'd like to say. Thank you. Well, what what I'd, I'd like to say is uh, a word or two of thanks to you uh, for coming down from, from Edinburgh to, to be here and, and to give us uh, your, your evidence, particularly um, evidence from someone who's so obviously expert, if you don't mind my saying so, um, and, and which has been very careful, um, very considered, uh, and uh, you've done what quite a number of witnesses don't, which is take time to think about the question before you've answered it, and I, I want to thank you for all of that. Um, uh, and uh, I, I wish you a... a a, a, an easy return to the north and hope the weather is perhaps something like it has been here today in London. It, it would be a welcome change, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Tomorrow, then. Tomorrow we have, in the morning, we have Dr Nicola Connor uh, and in the afternoon, um, or when she's finished, uh, we have um, a presentation on the VCJD chronology. Yes, well, that's what we look forward to at 10 o'clock tomorrow, 10 o'clock.